There you go. Oots, oots, oots. What the <laughs> fuck is that? <laughs> Hey, here we have Stephen Leak in the house. What's up? Oh, is that for me? Yeah, that's for me. Is that my intro music? Your name is Stephen Leak, isn't it? Yeah, no, your intro no. music is this. Wait, wait, wait. I did, I did my intro. Wait, wait, wait. Your intro is this. <laughs> <laughs> you can get the fuck out of my house. <laughs> I'm not even in your house. We are in Stephen's garage. Garage. Uh, garage. It's, garage will do. It took about like two hours for us to set it up. Because he doesn't know what he's doing yet. No, because he is a total mess. Um, <laughs> St- Stephen collects everything and anything. It's it's ridiculous. Basically, there's a little mis- misunderstanding. He thought we we're going to do a, a podcast in my van. Yep. Uh, but I thought we we're going to do it in his house. But in his house, everyone is watching football. There's dog. There's a lot of things going on. So we're in his garage. And do you see in the background what is going on here? This amazing, what is this? Quickly, tell us. It's a train set. It's a train set, as you can see, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I uh, built it for my son. He wanted a train set. What was the last time he was actually playing with it? <laughs> he played with it three times. It took me two and a half months to build. Yes. Yeah. So the first time when I came to Steven's house, I just saw all these things, like all these collectibles from the Star Wars, and it's just all, you have everything here. Yep, pretty much. But the problem is, Steven doesn't know when to give up on certain things. <laughs> well, like friendships. <laughs> oh. 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 Oh, it's like that. Okay. No. I don't, if you're referring to us, let's be honest, I have no friends in Bracknell. You are the only person I know here in Bracknell. In general or Bracknell? And in general as well. Yeah, yeah. Where's you, my, well, you've never had a friend like me. Never had a friend. Never had a friend. <laughs> That's the anthem. Where's my coffee? Somewhere gone. I don't know. I don't know where to put it. Anyway, so... Stephen is my first guest on a podcast in United Kingdom here. So a collection of blueprints uh, traveled all the way back from Bali, and now I'm here in United Kingdom. So um, I thought I will have a little chat with Stephen. Stephen is an armorer. I met him maybe two years ago on a film called The Courier. Uh, that was our we we met before. Yeah, but, but the we, first time we actually sat down and had a chat was on that. One. Yeah, the first time you realize you're in trouble. <laughs> Because you actually have to talk to me. Everyone had warned me earlier. <laughs> it didn't help. And uh, so Stephen is armor. He has guns everywhere. Like just just to prove my point. Here you go. Just randomly, I'm pulling out. What the hell is it? That, that's actually a rubber one from the courier. Here you go. That's a rubber one <laughs> from the courier. Knocking, no, that's the old guard. I don't know. Anyway, it's from somewhere. Um, so yeah, the guns are everywhere here. And um, well, before you became an armor, can you just quickly, not quickly, but just tell me about your past. So where are you from originally? Where did you live most of your life? You traveled a lot. You've been yeah. all over the place. Yeah, I've lived I've lived a few countries. Mm. And can you name one of them? <laughs> Some of them? <laughs> <laughs> no, I want to make this as boring as possible. This is number one for you. Oh, yeah. Well, I've uh, lived in Australia. I lived in South Africa. I've traveled pretty much everywhere. That just went to sleep. Oh, that's fine. I just decided you're not pretty enough. <laughs> I don't fucking no, blame it. No, still filming it. Yet. Um, yeah, no. Uh, I lived uh, wherever I stopped, pretty much. So, went to Hong Kong, stayed for a while, just kept going to another country. Just wanted to see the world, but I've just always hated holidays themselves. I don't. Mm. I don't. I'm not a fan of a holiday. Going to somewhere and not actually experiencing the culture just seemed pointless. And unfortunately, my wife likes to go places and sit by the swimming pool and sun herself, whereas I would prefer to go and find out what's going on. So you were born and raised in the United Kingdom, in actually in Bracknell. This is where you're from. Down the road. From Down me, the yeah. road, very but close. I was, I was born up in London Way. Who doesn't know where Bracknell is? And it's a fair point why you don't know where the Bracknell is. Uh, it's not far away from uh, Reading. Ascot is nearby, Basingstoke. Uh, it's about 40 minutes away from London, right? Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and possibly, I don't know, Windsor. Somewhere Windsor. people will know. Oh yeah, the ca- yeah, yeah, Z yeah, Castle. Yeah, yeah. Z Castle, very important uh, place. And then uh, to, 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 to do so, your high school, uh, university. Did you study university? Do you have a degree? You look like you have a degree. Well, I, I may <laughs> look like I have a degree, but I, I don't have any of those kind of in form. rock and roll. <laughs> no, just no. The hair is a completely different story. The hair is for work. Oh, is it? Armourers need to look as they just step off the Mad Max. No, no, <laughs> it, it really it really isn't. It's one of those, quite often as an armourer, we get called onto set and we're not the main armourer. We get called in because we're needed to do something mm. or they need to rent some of our guns or, you know, we're subbing in. And when you get cast, 
a lot of cast, as you know, they don't really spend much time learning who we are. Mm. There's no way to identify us. So if there's three other armory companies on the same set and the actor or actress is finished with the gun and they want to give it back because yeah. they know they need to give it back before they leave set. Uh, they turn to the nearest AD, whoever, and kind of go, um, who do I give this to? And it's so much easier if they go, you know the tall guy with the red hair? Yeah. Nice or one. the guy with the long hair? And they always come back to me. And so that way you end up building up a relationship with uh, actors and actresses. You end up chatting around, and then the next thing you know, you're doing the next film. Mm. And it's, mm. it's, I mean, I suppose it's psychological programming in some way, shape, or form. But no, it's totally those, right. I, you need to stand out. I, I mean, th- yeah. you're the short, loud one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if it's going to, if, if where's the stunt guys? You know, which one do I go to? Do you know the short, loud one? Yeah, that's Renaz. Go, go find him. <laughs> and you can be picked out in a crowd. How dare you? That's never, true. I'm, I can agree with the loud one, but it's short. <laughs> You're not the shortest one, I know, but... By the way, so those who don't know, my chair is like literally this much <laughs> higher than Steven's. And I'm not sitting and up he, straight, I'm yeah. leaning on purpose and just so that we're kind of at the same level. And he still looks taller. <laughs> yeah. Armour, how long have you been doing that? And how did you get into it? Cause, because before that, you've done so many different things. You've done... Um, I've had a lot of jobs. Electrical stuff. You electrical used to own stuff. a shop. Electrician. Shop, electrician. Uh, shops and uh, all sorts. Uh, I just get bored. And I want to do something else. And I, I, I fell into being an armourer 21 years ago. Is it 21 years 21 already? years now. Oh, wow. My first film was... Um, oh, it was with Rick Mayle. <laughs> what the fuck is that? <laughs> I just thought, why not? Yeah, it was uh, with Rick Mayle and it was 20, 21 years ago. Brilliant mm. director called Ray Brady. Um, Day of the Sirens, that was it. And it was it was a tiny little tiny little film, um, and someone came in and wanted to hire a couple of guns, and I'm just like, no, but I'll bring them down. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's like, oh, we need seven or eight. So I got seven or eight of my mates who also had guns, and we all just went down and we did the film, and yeah, it kind of just went on from there. When and you then, say you you and your mates had guns, you could have to elaborate. <laughs> we just had guns, real well, guns, rubber no, guns. No, no, what no, kind of guns? They were they were they were at the time they were just airsoft guns. The airsoft they they ones, didn't yeah. need any of that kind of stuff. They needed like lasers and smoke and bits and pieces. And um, it was uh, Rick's first serious role hmm. outside of all the comedy that he did. Um, and so it's like, well, yeah, of course I'm going to come down. I mean, it was two hundred quid. We slept on someone's floor, and uh, uh, I think it was actually the producers. We slept in his lounge. All six of us went out for a curry, and the next thing you know, we were on set filming. But before that, you, um, I remember you told me the story about getting airsoft guns. You were one of the first ones who got them in the United Kingdom, and you yeah, guys yeah, opened the shop, there was right? A, uh, um, a mate of mine, Simon, uh, and and he just started getting them into the country, and from that point on, it was just yeah, I've been around them for. 30, 30 odd years. But you worked in the shop first, right? You, you yeah, were yeah, also yeah. co-owner? That, Did you? Uh, that was Simon and David. That was their shop initially. And oh, okay. uh, yeah, and I went in and we just worked and sold stuff. And, and back then it was, it was the wild west of this kind of sport. It was Pure in Reading, younger. wasn't it? Yeah, it was it's actually in Reading. I mean, these guys, uh, Rebel Troop, they're, they're the first. They were the, the first to do this. And the guys were fantastic. They knew, they knew their stuff inside out. Yeah. And it just got easier from there. Um, and then... I decided after doing a few more films, hey, this isn't for me. The film, the film industry is a terrible place to be. <laughs> I mean, unfortunately, the film industry is. If, anybody, the if anybody's thinking about getting into it, mm. I would say think about it, then have a drink, mm. think about it again, and then look at your life and see if you really want to screw it all up because it really it's not a good place to be. You, yeah, you, but in, you, in, you if you no look time. like that, it's it's pretty much any area is it has downs and ups. You know, there, someone there are, who hates mundane everyday eight to five stuff. Oh, I couldn't do that anymore. You know, exactly. <laughs> I could never work in office exactly. again because so I, that that that's what I'm saying. Like for me, that never would work. I would rather be a couple of weeks and months maybe without work, but then you know, and then do what no, I really I, enjoy doing. I do agree. It's just it's not a real life in many ways. Hmm. You know, I, and you can't explain it to a normal <laughs> I say a normal person that sounds wrong you can't explain it to someone who's never been in the industry because they don't quite get it I've sat on a spaceship and had lunch mm. I've you know I, I've, I've walked through a castle I've you know fought a dragon mm. um, I've stood on a mountain in the middle of 
um, oh God, where were we? Morocco. And I've just thought to myself, oh, I'd really like an iced latte. And we're in the middle of nowhere, and all of a sudden, I've got an iced latte. <laughs> and y- y- you can't really explain to people. If you try to, they're just not going to believe you. People who don't do this for a living will not understand. And then they don't understand the hours. The hours we do are ridiculous in mm. this country. Well, especially in this country. But you get a two-hour pre-call, and then you get a 12-hour day or an 11-hour day, but you get an hour for lunch, and then you've still got to pack your stuff up at the end of the day. Then you've got to drive it back to the yard. Then you've got to drop it all off. You're doing 18 hours a day. The wages are good. I'm not going to lie that. But I think my youngest son, I've been present for five of his birthdays, and I think my eldest, probably nine. He's 13 now. Mm. He's almost as tall as me. I've missed school plays. I've missed birthdays. I've missed weddings. I've missed all sorts of stuff. Just because the industry takes it from you, yeah. So, for but those, you end up loving the industry, yeah. So, for those who want to be um, have a family life, yeah, that's, no, tra- that's no, no, going to no, be no. tough. You're going you're gonna to have a really tough time of it, purely yeah. on the grounds that it just eats your days away. I mean, I, I we had a family holiday planned for week after next, and I'm going to have to turn up two days late, so I'm going to have to drive up there purely on the grounds that I'm filming now. And it's my company. I mean, I, I started up a, a, another armory company with a friend of mine well, about a year and a half ago. And it's just it's just gone mental. So mm. what do you do? And the second you say no, the second you say no to a, a client and a job, they find somebody else and that's the person they then use forevermore until they get let down. And yeah. then they might come back to you. So, so you have to, so take, you just have to and, say yes. Yeah, you have to say yes. Um, okay, tell me about, uh, again, so many people who hopefully going to listen to this podcast, uh, don't know about what Armoury um, entails and what is it all about. Just give us a breakdown. What kind of guns were uh, actors usually use on a set? 90% of the time, it's a lump of rubber. You know this. So for, no, yeah. So <laughs> 99% for those, of the time. Those who are watching uh, films uh, uh, and baddies running around with the big guns and, and shooting, um, it's it's what? It's just a CGI effect? Uh, uh, a it's fire becoming more through. CGI effect. Up until about five, ten years ago, no, you were using um, real guns modified to fire blanks. Mm-hmm. So we'd spend a lot of time, you know, modifying them to fire such. Um, but it's... <sighs> It's got to the point where people have become more savvy. They play computer games more often and they kind of understand the way guns work. Mm-hmm. Um, and you see a gun with a silencer on it. It's not really a silencer. It's a moderator, but whatever. And you get flash coming out the front of it. It's because there's no projectile flying out. Mm-hmm. But you're firing a blank, so you end up with a big flame coming out the front of a gun that shouldn't have a flame. We now have ways of getting around that. Um uh, there's special ammunition types we can use. There's a lot of modification that can be involved, but 99% of the time, it's either a hard cast or a cold, uh, a soft cast rubber gun. Because I mean, to be fair, guns are heavy. Actors don't like running around. Exactly. Also, you fall all over with that gun. You can hurt yourself and destroy the it. gun and all that stuff. When yeah. we did a job on a film called Overlord, I remember one of the uh, stun guys had to react on the uh, uh, gun gunshots. As he fought, fell down, he literally smashed this like uh, old school, very like nice gun, um, which is all made of metal and everything. And the armor came over and was like, "What did you do? Like this is expensive, you know." And the guy's like, "How do you want me to fall? Like it's not like I can just, you know, fall softly on it or whatever. It's gonna be, you know, destroyed or or or, or ruined." So in this case, I need something rubber, which you should be thinking about. But I think one of the things where people get confused, uh, they see running from the distance with a gun, but then when there's a close-up, then they see a real gun. And that's the thing. On a close-up, you usually change it to not Seconds. real, real gun, but... Yeah. I mean, if you're getting to a quarter size, then, you know, if, if, it's a, if it's a single or a quarter, then, yeah, then you start using something more realistic. Mm-hmm. But, um, I mean, that's the reason we set up Alamo, was purely to become an ethical armory. Um, one of the things that most people... Um, don't realise a lot of actors are actually quite ethical people. They're oh. actually really good people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's just like, duh. Duh. Um, but they understand. Um, if you do a Second World War film, the the guns that would be being used at that point in time would have been fresh out of the box. Mm-hmm. But to do it with blank fires these days, that gun's 100 years old, 80 years old. I mean, it's old, it's battered, it's pockmarked. It, it doesn't look how it would have looked or should look for filming. Mm-hmm. So the whole point of our armoury is, first of all, we make sure that the guns are 
as clean as they should be for the time period they're being set in. Um, and the second thing we want to do is that most of these guns have history. They're real guns. Some of these guns, they stopped making them at the end of the Second mm. World War. These guns that uh, are being used on set are guns that have potentially killed people. They, they're seized weapons. They're weapons that have been got from somewhere or another. They, 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 they have a history. All they're guns. Really, they actually would have those kind of guns. Well, yeah. The ones which were used think, in... Where do you think you get, you know, a, a blunderbuss or a, an old flintlock? Because I think you, I would assume that there's this a special place where they make them from scratch. <laughs> um, yeah, you'd think that. Hmm. It's not kind of the case for quite a lot of these guns. And uh, that's why we moved away from using real guns wherever possible. Just hmm. for two reasons. First of all, stunt guys need to be safe. And hmm. as much as I take the piss out of you, we do kind of like <laughs> stunt guys. I can name you some good ones if you want, but then there's you as well. Um, <laughs> I go on very bottom of the list. <laughs> you're not bottom of the list, but... <laughs> one before. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, if, if I scrape the bottom, I may find you. <laughs> um, but uh, no, you you got you to gotta think that stunt guys are riding a motorbike, firing a machine gun. Mm. These flashes can be fixed in post. Mm. So why should I put a gun in your hand that's going to... Yeah, you fall just off. doesn't make sense. Well. Accidents happen. Uh, and we've tried to negate that completely by removing the, the the level of danger that's required. But it's, you know what, it's it's going really well for us right now. At the moment, it's it's ridiculous. As the more people get the hang of what we do, because um, ninety percent of the time it's not it's not the flash that comes out the front of the gun that's as dangerous. It's the bit of brass shooting out the side, the black yeah. round that's going sideways. The empty shells. The empty shells. You've got the camera crew. Is there. that a very British name for it? Brass. It's made of brass. Made of brass. Is that the metal? Yes, oh. that's what, that's what, uh, uh, yeah, anyway, so you've got this flying out the side at high speed, yeah. you've got a flash coming out the front, and we've got you guys trying to fight each other while holding them. Yeah, mm. it's just, the, uh, we, we, the, our aim at the moment is to try and get rid of all of that, mm. and push it back to a, let's let the stunt guys do what they want to do best, which is fall off a building and die. I mean, generally, that's your job, yeah, right? That's you, you die. They, don't, they <laughs> very rarely get stunt guys to come in. and. My happens. nephew, every time he sees a new film with me, he's like, why did you die again? <laughs> like, that's the other thing. People who get in the film industry don't realise, I'd say one year. One year in the film industry, maybe two or three projects, you can't watch much TV anymore oh, or yeah, many that's, films. That's, that's the other one. I'm sitting watching something the other day, and it's like, I see John walk in. Mm. There's going to be a fight. Someone's going to get punched. Yeah. Uh, that's John Sharp. That's our mate, <laughs> yeah. mate Stunty. He's, uh, John's a legend. And one of the nicest for... guys ever. He looks like an ogre who just like escaped from the cave finally. But he's like the sweetheart. He's, he's an absolute yeah. sweetheart. But it's one of those... Yeah. he he's, yeah, You yeah. know them and you're watching and everything you watch. You know, you watch like Black Panther and you see Gee come on and you kind of go, yeah. It's a Scott Atkins film. You know someone's going to get punched. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know it's what's like, I think happen. for those who, uh, British stunt guys, anytime we see a film where we don't recognize the baddies, that's most of the time it's it's American production or it's filmed in States or maybe rarely in Australia. Yeah. But then there's so many films and that's one of the mi- misconceptions. People think that Hollywood is still a very big thing. I mean, it is, but comparing it with UK, I think... Am I right to say that UK have about if seventy to eighty percent of the whole films in the world? Or at the moment, yeah, we're doing we're doing great since Brexit. We're doing great guns, but not even not even at the moment, but like the last five years. I don't know. A lot of productions come here because our crews are the best, mm. pretty much. I mean, the American crews are fantastic, but um, actually, everywhere you go, they've got fantastic crews, but. You try and find the amount of talent in a very small amount of mm. space. The UK is where you come to because it's not a big place. No, no. And especially around London, we have also like, what are the biggest studios? Warner Brothers, well, you got, yeah, Shepperton's. You've got Leavesden, Shepperton, Pinewood, Long Cross, um, Three Mills. You've got uh, Park Royal at the moment. They're all filming over there. Mm. Um, it's so close and it's very easy to get a lot of crew. But at the moment, there's so much going on here. Yeah, when I say leaves, then it's Wonder Brothers, or it's Wonder Brothers, or <laughs> which it's, one it is leaves it? in studios. But I think Warner Brothers have now either bought it or they've rented it for the next however many years. years. Uh, they just yeah, <laughs> and it's still called Leaves. <laughs> yeah, but Disney got Pinewood, and I think Netflix got Shepperton, right. and so all the productions that yeah, the, the big studios that we had here, um, they've all been taken over by the bigger companies. Yeah, um, 
Oh, it, uh, even Gillette. Uh, there's, yeah, a, Gillette there's a lovely well. building if uh, if you don't know London at all. If you're driving up the M4 uh, as you go into London, there's a building on the left hand side. Um, it's a big clock, and it used to be the Gillette building where they made the razors and everything, and then they moved on to a better factory somewhere, I'm sure. And that's now been turned into a studios. We've got um, studios going on. Oh, there's a new one opening in Reading. There's a rebellion over in Oxford. There's a there's a lot of a lot of people who are just opening up more studios. Yeah, and yeah. there's not enough people to staff it. <laughs> That's the biggest problem we got at the minute. There's just not enough people who can actually staff the jobs. Yeah, yeah. Which is which is great, but at the same time, I mean, everybody's pushed. Okay, so we spoke about armor stuff and what kind of guns we have, about the film industry in general. Uh, train set. Uh, uh, yeah, and train what about, set what about is the amazing. Train set? The one you built, it or took you three years and your son played with it three times. Or the collection of Star Wars. <laughs> what um, connections or maybe cool cool experience or maybe cool stories you have with any of the uh, actors with the with the guns and stuff? That's that's the question I usually get asked and I'm like, get kind of, eh. We get asked a lot of questions. <laughs> everybody who doesn't work in the industry always yeah. wants to know oh have you worked with such and such yeah, what's such yeah, and such yeah. like yeah. and so far oh what I are the most annoying questions what do you get asked uh, why so you can ask him to everybody else no no, no 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 I'm just wondering because for me as a stunt guy I've always asked uh, who you doubled who did you double and and it's like uh, do you do so you always double and I'm like no I always play a Russian baddie I don't double at all you sometimes so, do Polish <laughs> do polish as well now it's just a misconception that they think that all the stun guys all we do is doubling double jobs what yeah. is the what is the what is the um, football thing going on it's right now the oh, finals it's 1-0 one nil. it's 1-0 one nil. It's um, one nil. I'm not even a football fan but come on it's the final I've got, yeah, to, I've got final. to pay some attention to it no 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 we, we everyone's going to talk about it at work we just started right before we started recording and uh, they got goal and it was like oh yeah, shit literally before we started oh there's a free kick um yeah, the most annoying the most question. Annoying question yeah, the when most, they found out the that most you're common question. Okay, is what's your favorite gun? Okay, what is your favorite gun? <laughs> I don't have one. I don't like guns. I think they're a terrible, terrible thing. But I guess probably like just visually how they look. Um, and it's yeah, to handle. I mean, at the moment, the one we've got out on set that I think looks the best is uh, we've got an H and K G twenty eight. It looks absolutely stunning, but we spent a lot of time mm. modifying it, and it's a bit sci fi. This um, production we're currently working on. So we've had to 3D print a lot of stuff and make a lot of stuff. And yeah, I suppose that's one of the advantages we have is the fact that because the, the guns we're currently using aren't classed as real. No, don't even show that. That's a that's a hunk of junk. That's another gun. <laughs> no, I just want to show how randomly I just reach for anywhere in this yeah, fucking that's place. Just, that's a piece of shit and that I gave tons to a gun guy to use. <laughs> And, and, and wants to practice. And uh, um, Stephen said earlier, like, oh, oh, are we allowed to swear on this podcast? Because uh, uh, well, you know, yeah, no, like, like, a lot of people care. are not going to watch it. But then, then, like, look, we actually have a gun here. How many people are going to lose now <laughs> from watching this? Uh, I think I think you get demonetized on YouTube because of the fact you've got a gun. Oh, but it's plastic. Does it count? I uh, don't know. I'm not sure what the rules are on that. I just know that there's so many. Well, my podcast is not there's, known there's well enough. Of, yeah, there's a load of swords around here that are better and axes and. Swords and axes. There's all the sights from Robocop. But your main one. thing your main thing is guns. My main thing is guns. I don't really want to do much swords and sandals mm. stuff, but I mean the money's there. If someone wants me to do it, we're mm. more than capable. We've got the equipment. Um but yeah, I would say what's your favourite gun? Mm -hmm. Um The next one would probably be who's your who's the worst person you've worked with? Oh yeah. Yeah. Who is it? I'm not going to say <laughs> because it's all in the press. <laughs> oh, shit. Oh, shit. Yeah, yeah. What do you mean all in the press? Like, As in, it's been quite a lot in the press about this person recently. And yeah, I'm not the only person that thinks he's not great to work with. Oh, okay. Or she, potentially. Or oh, what she. Do you could, what do you could tell? They tell the greatest experience. We can definitely tell the greatest experience with uh, an actor or actress. It, 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 that would be almost impossible to pick. Because they're I've all had great. such good times with all of them. Mm. you got to bear in mind it's like you stunt guys when you go and do rehearsals you're usually rehearsing with the, the, the cast member you get to know them quite well I get two weeks three weeks with them and just practicing with the guns and mm. learning how to hold it and how to shoot it and what to do and so you, you get that one on one time that you most people within well I suppose hair and makeup get time with them in the mornings but you get to know them really quite well and because of that 
you can, I suppose, you get to almost be mates with them. Mm. But that's that's another thing that, that ties into the industry. It's one of those, you miss your family when you're not with them, but the crew become your family because you're family, there yeah. for eight months, you know, whatever. Um, and so you really begin to like these people. Mm. And the same with cast. You can have a bad day with them. You can have a stand-up row with an A-list actor right to their face, and then 20 minutes later, you're back at craft services getting them a coffee and mm. hanging out and having a chat and then going back to the trailer. And so, yeah, to try and say which one would be the best, there isn't one. Yeah, it's just too, too there's, many there's good been, There's been yeah. amazing moments that you just... I guess... Um, Okay, I know. I'm, I'm just thinking, I'm just thinking, right? Okay, so I worked with Sam Rockwell on Blue Iguana. Mm -hmm. And I never knew that he was into uh, lassoing things. And I walk in. Lassoing or so lassoing? Lassoing. So he, he had a rope with him. And I didn't ask why because it wasn't part of my kit and, you know, it was what he was doing. And then he would just randomly at lunchtime go and put a chair outside a pub in the middle of London and just practice getting the lasso over the chair. <laughs> like and, lasso? Yeah, that's it. Is that the British thing to say, lasso? It's American. I don't know what the fuck it's It's lasso. Called. Is it lasso? I don't even know that. We don't know. But I, just, I thought they, he says, look. he likes suing people. <laughs> well, no, I, I know a few of them as well. But um, <laughs> and I, Then yeah. I thought sewing, like sewing. But, but he was just one of the most generous people with his time. Ooh, and nice. you, you just couldn't get around the fact that, you know, oh, bloody hell, that's Sam Rockwell. Mm. And it does sometimes. There's very few actors that I've stood in front of and gone, "Oh shit!" Yeah, <laughs> because you've just you just know them by that point in time. Um, you'll remember on the Courier, mm. uh, we had we had Gary Oldman on that. Yeah, I mean, come on, the guy's a fucking legend. Yeah, I was. He's an absolute. Superstar. I was in the makeup with him. But I didn't recognize him. I was just sitting there, and he came in later, and he sat next to me. Yeah, <laughs> and he said something. But I was like, I, I wasn't, uh, um, I couldn't move around because they were doing my hair and all that stuff. But oh God, and I thought shit. like, and but like, what would I do? Would I turn to the left and say hello, sir? How are you? It's like, well, no, someone. it's just, it's a random one. I mean, you know, I used to have uh, my crew gift is um, that I give out to whoever wants one is a t-shirt generally with my face on it because mm. I think it's funny. <laughs> it makes me laugh. Your, your face is funny. <laughs> well, no, I just think it's funny that that, that they're gonna, people just want it. They want the crew gift. They want something to do with the film because they worked on it. So you give them a picture of a, a t-shirt with your face on it. Mm. And we were on that one and, and it was a very simple scene. He didn't have a lot to do uh, within the film, but what he did, he did in the way that Gary Oldman always does it, which is professional. He gets in the zone and he does it. Um, I met his partner. She was lovely. We were chatting away. I handed him his gun. And the gun that I made him was uh, basically it was a replica of the gun that was used to kill him in Leon. Oh. So it was a it was a M92 Beretta or an M9 Beretta with a, a, a compensator on the front of it. It was that's the gun that he uses in the film. Mm. And I handed it over to him, and he looked at it and just kind of went, <laughs> "I see what you're doing there." I'm like, "Yeah, okay, wow. we're already on the same page." So we get through all of that, and we do the shot, and then he stands to one side, and he's once again is very generous with his time. He wants to watch everybody else acting the scene mm. because he wants to give them the time that they've all given him because everybody was bloody there. I mean, let's put it this way. There were no stunts on that day. Every single stunt guy turned up because they want the selfie. Mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's one of those, well, Except you me. didn't, you didn't, you weren't there. Yeah, I, I, I didn't bother getting a selfie. I don't need it. My name's on the end of the film, um, you know. No, but at the same time, I, I, I like the subject. I like the subject about when uh, stunties or whoever crew is on a set and they get the selfie thing. I never got, I never, I never understood it. I do. I, I mean, so what, what like on, you on rap, on rap, I get selfies, to this person, but generally it's not for me. I understand if it's like a, a, a we lined up, like there's a lot of us and it's like a team kind of photo, but just like, hey, excuse me, sir, I would like to, uh, to have a selfie with you. Why? The amount of times I've it. heard somebody, uh, various people, uh, not just stunt guys, even members of crew, etc., who would just turn around and be like, oh, there's your timer. Yeah, perfect. Um, okay, we are finishing this first segment and uh, we'll be back in the second. And it And we are back. <laughs> wait, 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 no. I have a sound for you. Hey. <laughs> I think that's for you. That's a next 
topic of this podcast is going to be about what the other buttons do. What's the other buttons do? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's your comedy gig. I recognize that one. Shut up. My comedy is always goes like this. Yeah. When they, when they <laughs> right, say the, the last, last act. Do you want to do the last one? Check this out. Do the last one. Oh, you got to invest in new sounds. <laughs> I mean, seriously, that's... I'm, yeah, I will work on that. Okay, we're back. Um, while uh, Stephen was away checking on his family, <laughs> if, they, if it's still there. Because <laughs> you never know. You do never know. Work in this industry, it just could be gone one day. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, some of the scariest moments for you. Did you have any, like, close calls with uh, with the gun stuff? No. Good one. <laughs> uh, inside of the working environment, no. Because health and safety is very high level in the UK. That's it's one of the main reasons, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, once again, it's one of the reasons why we set things up the way we did is purely because of the fact that health and safety is the most important thing. And mm. 99% of an armourer's job on set is a health and safety officer, your job is just to make sure that people don't injure themselves mm -hmm. or other people with the guns you've given them. All the swords or knives, it's not, you know, it's a pair of scissors. I did one with a pair of scissors. And main reason why people get injured is uh, just falling probably on some harder um, uh, guns and stuff, I presume. I think I would say that's probably the majority of the injuries, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, it's a firearm. You know, if, if, if that muzzle was next to your head... Mm. You're in big trouble. Um, there's a lot of moving parts. You, you know, you've got an explosion basically going off in your hand every mm. time you pull the trigger. Um, with the swords, sometimes they're sharp because they want to do a close-up on it. Uh, with daggers, and you know, we don't use them so much anymore. But retractables, the old retractable daggers and bits and pieces, they were they're, they're great the first time you use them. Oh, there was a story about retractable. Someone thought it's retractable, but it wasn't. I've seen that happen. Well, I've I've I've, <laughs> I've seen I've, that happen. I've I've seen people going, "Oh, look, it's retractable." Um, but the problem is, is as soon as the fake blood goes on, uh. it's no longer a retractable because it kind of gets in the. You have the, the tolerances are so tight on a retractable because mm. when it's in the, the out position, so it's not retracted, um, it needs to look like it's a single sword or a mm. single dagger. And it's only when it retracts. And then it looks wrong because it kind of gets fatter as the, the the small section goes in. So there's a lot of engineering that goes into making them. And the people who do do bother with that are, mm. are incredibly talented. But and that kind of stuff costs a lot. So productions... It costs, it costs a lot and it can go wrong really quickly. So all we do now is we make three swords. I'll make a sword and then I'll make a sword that's half as long mm -hmm. with the end cut off and that's got a bit of green tape and the some green key tape. markers on it and, and then I make a short one that's just a hilt. Explain why the green tip. A lot of people are not going to understand this. <laughs> when the VFX guys who are absolute wizards mm. these guys I, I have no idea how they do what they do. No. no. <laughs> I've watched enough videos and I, I know enough of the terminology but what we do is we put a marker on the end mm. so that they can build the sword back again so we we give them the original sword so like on on the, um let's say the old god we had a saber that uh Charlie's uses in the church to stab people yeah so Stephen now, worked on old guard he was uh, were you the main armor there uh, no it was tim tim lewis is uh the amazing tim lewis uh, he's doing some brilliant stuff at the moment um an old guard is very job. it was his cool job film. i went in as um supervising armor or lead armor whichever one you want to call it mm. um but uh, he actually crafted this beautiful sabre. Uh, and we give it over to the VFX guys who they take it out in the daylight and they take millions of photos of this thing from every pos possible angle. And then they do it in a different lighting. Um, and so they can rebuild it. And then what we do is we cut uh, a rubber one or whatever down, uh, put a green marker on, and then they can take the tip feed it into their wizard computer, mm. which then puts it back. So whilst it's being stabbed into people and being pulled out, they can generate those. Um, it's it's just a dark art. I mean, these guys... Well, for a lot of people, dark art is be, being a stunt performer or, or, or doing the armor. That's just falling downstairs. <laughs> or doing armor or stuff, you know. It's like, it's just something what we don't really know it, that it much. It is, but it's one of those things that I think... Stunt guys put their body through a lot mm. and they have to be a lot before you even consider being a stuntman from what I can tell you've got to know certain disciplines you've got to be a black belt in whatever you know you, you've got to have done high diving and 
learn to ride horses or motorbikes or whatever. So you've got a massive long list of skill sets that you need before you can even start. Mm. Um, armor is not so much. Well, that's you can you start off at the bottom and you just you learn from there. You learn on the job uh, 90% of the time. So most of what you learn, you can learn while doing it. A stunt guy can't learn how to be hit by a car mm. <laughs> unless he's practiced it a lot of times. You don't just walk on the set going, oh, okay, you're going to set me on fire and then push me out of a helicopter. Yeah, but you still have to have a, a certain skill set, um, you know, that someone would actually let you on, on the set. And if you get, show up on the set and <laughs> you're like, oh, well, I don't know, I'm just going to learn it on the I spot. I don't know, there's one or two that, out that's there. That's the last time you're going to be on that set. <laughs> yeah, no, there's a, there's, a, there's a certain amount of bullshit that's got to go yeah. in, into the industry just to get you through the door. Uh, but... I don't know. You guys, you're off your head. I've seen what you guys do. And I go, yeah, if I was younger, I could do that. Mm. But I don't want to. I've got no urge to be on camera. This is bad enough. <laughs> right? I, I have no desire to be in front of camera. Yet I seem to end up there quite regularly because on quite a few smaller productions, you just... Because you're just so beautiful. You turn up. Well, no, they turn up and they go, how long is it going to take to teach him how to take that gun apart? And you go, hour? Oh, we haven't got time for that. Can you just... D- put on this jacket and stand there and be the hands oh i have experience in that because i was taking <laughs> apart and putting together a old rifle on uh, peaky blinders yeah when i was playing the italian assassin uh, there's <laughs> a clo- sure. close-up where you can just see my hands opening this um, cloth and then i have to well, put together obviously not taking apart because I'm, i'm about to use it so putting together and all that stuff and it took me a little bit i wouldn't say a little bit. I would say a little bit, yeah, but it was like an hour when so the guy taught me how to do it. Yeah, and, and we can do it. We can train people and show people exactly yeah. how to do these things, but quite often these days, the way that productions are moving so quickly and they mm. want to get they they've got to get that next shot and and they need to move the next setup and they know it's gonna take two hours to move the crane and the lights. They just go, oh, it's just easier to put him in. Yeah, yeah. And then even when you're doing reshoots, quite often when you're doing a reshoot the actor's not available. He's already moved on to something else. Mm. But the, once again, that blue iguana. There's a scene where um, oh, Ben Schwartz has got to put a tampon into a bullet hole in Sam Rockwell's leg. As you do tampon in a bullet hole, yeah. Because it's a running joke in the film. It's a good film. Um, <laughs> I, I really like it. Uh, but there's a, the, I mean, it's the posters in my, uh, one of the posters in my dining room. Um, but the actor wasn't there. Because they've all gone home, and we're just doing reshoots of you know a, a bit of gun bit. And yeah, so that would be just and close so, up. And so they do a close up, like and they just went, yeah, okay. Can can you just put on this pair of jeans, sit in the chair, and just fumble around? And then he's like, "This is my time to shine." <laughs> oh yeah, yes. oh, always. All yeah. the dreams come true. Finally. No, the director and I've uh, we've worked together quite a lot, and he knows full well that I hate being in front of camera. <laughs> it's not. I, it's not. It's what we were talking about earlier. It's exactly what you and I were talking about before we started rolling the cameras. There's people in this industry who mm. they may work behind the cameras, but they would love so much to be in front of it. Mm. Not me. And there are performers who, you know, they deserve the roles that we end up getting given because mm. we're just there. And it's about being in the right place at the, yeah, right, the right time, time. Uh, for everything. And I don't know, I, I get... I, I, that's why I you have quite, red red hair because you don't want to be in the shot no this is the worst thing on the project we're at the minute <laughs> I did that well no the one I've just finished um, <laughs> it's, it's a brilliant TV series this is the second season of it and uh, we were doing some tests of some bullet hits mm. so I'm holding a box and it's got some squibs in it and I've got a couple of squibs on me as well um, just to show uh, the stunt performers and the director what it was we were going to do the effect wise because I do a bit of special effects work as you know Um And so, yeah, everyone gets their phones out. Right, three, two, one, test. And I just bang, 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 and send it off. And I had my hair tied back, but it was red. I had my sunglasses on, mainly to protect myself from the blood that was going to be squirting out of everything. Um, That's why you have your sunglasses now. No, I have these on. <laughs> Cause Cause any cause, moment I'm going to blow cause, up. Because you set like 20 lights up in here, and it's, it's, <laughs> it's fucking ridiculous. But... Um, Yeah, no, having glasses on, because either this or, or really horrible safety glasses, which is all we had, and I'm not wearing them. You know, I'm, I'm a prima donna if it comes. Exactly. If I'm going to be on camera, I'm going to look good. But we did the shot and then sent it off. Uh, you know, you put it on the WhatsApp groups that they all set up just so that they can see what it is we were doing. And they're like, oh, no, can we not just have him? 
we like his look. His look is perfect for the job. I'm like, no, you can't, mate. I'm, I'm going to be wiring up you the boxes. You can't afford this. I'm going to be helping Mike and uh, Alex and everybody get all the all the rigs together. And you know, I, I think as it turned out, when that that scene happened, I was on a smoke machine, putting smoke machine uh, dust out and making some more hits up, uh, some cork hits to go on the wall. Um, because that's changed as well. The way that that happens. Mm. Um, ten years ago, you know, you had bullet hits in the wall. They'd make a flat that you bolted onto the front of a wall that looked like the original wall and then there'd be all the all the pyro behind it and then you'd fill it and then you'd make the bullet holes and now they, they do it with cork blocks or cork blocks covered in tin foil with a little charge in them mm. they stick them on the wall VFX guys paint it out and then it goes bang 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 and there you go and, so, and then you want to reset it because everything's got to be done so quickly yeah. you need to get going yeah because everything costs so much uh, location the crew the expenses are ridiculous on on that particular project alone, I think we were burning eight grand, nine grand a minute, if not more. And if you hold the production up for ten minutes, you know you've blown eighty grand. Yeah, that's but, like me in casino. Yeah, well, I know you blow every because <laughs> I don't know how to play because oh, I just blow stuff. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> well, we've heard that, but it is it is a whole. The industry is really changing to try and keep everything moving forward, mm. and and the way I've noticed that that's what's been going on. You probably know this about. Five, six years ago, you'd do a take, and then you'd do another take, and then they'd do another take, mm. and then you'd hear the director or the first AD going, that's perfect, that's absolutely fantastic, to the lead car actors, and then they'd go, right, we're going to do it one more time. And I was on a film <laughs> with a, 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 an amazing actor, um, but he's old school. He's, he's, a, he's an older actor who's been doing this for a long time, and he knows his shit. He started in theatre. Mm. And he literally stood up and just went, no, nah, I'm going to my trailer. And everyone was kind of like, what, what, what? He goes, no, you said it was perfect. If it was perfect, that's the one we're keeping. If it's not perfect, tell me what I'm doing wrong, and I'll do it that way, and then I'll go to my trailer. But I'm cold, I'm tired, and I don't want to keep doing this. And he wasn't being shitty. He was being perfectly correct, which is, yeah. don't bullshit me. That's what I keep doing on the set. and I don't know why I'm not getting any work anymore. <laughs> <laughs> what, fucking I'm up? I'm going or? to my trailer. That's yeah, it. That, that's it, I'm done. <laughs> no, he didn't, he didn't do that on the... Out knuckle of... Knuckle Dust, it was Knuckle Dust. Was it? No, Knuckle Dust was where, he, yeah. Oh. No, your outfit in that. I mean, come on. I was uh, my outfit was amazing, Knuckle Dust. Anyone who's uh, haven't seen Knuckle Dust, <laughs> don't watch it. <laughs> no, if you want to see me in latex, yes, go for it. Uh, um, yeah, it wasn't just the latex. Tell was me, it? tell me, if you need to pick, it's going to be very difficult. Three most exciting projects in your career so far in twenty years. You said it's 21. twenty one. Twenty twenty one. Um, the first project I worked on, like they don't, say, that they was, don't count. Well, it was twenty one years ago. <laughs> The most exciting projects, yeah. or the ones three. I've enjoyed. Give me three. Like just, just what you would say, maybe that you learned the most, or you just you just had the best time. Oh, crap. Now you're asking a question. I know. Here you go, finally. See, now there's, there's a film called Dead in a Week or Your Money Back. Mm. Uh, it was directed by uh, Tom Edmonds, and uh, Daniel Conrad Cooper was the producer, and we had them. Um, oh, it was one of the most pleasurable experiences Every single person who read the script went, even the cast, was like, wow, w I just want to make this. It's a beautiful mm. script. It's a beautifully made film. And there wasn't a day over the four or five weeks we were filming where anybody, and I mean anybody, not a PA, not a you know, grip, nobody complained. They just enjoyed the process because we knew what was going to happen. We knew where the story was going. And it just felt like it was going to be perfect mm. and it is it's a beautiful perfect film that because of the subject matter mm -hmm. here in the uk i mean i don't even think they uh, they accepted it for uh, uh best film at edinburgh film festival uh, there was some kind of issue with it uh, because of the fact that it deals with uh suicide right this is very taboo <sighs> in a fun it's way oh, <laughs> and, it's, and it's like it's not but it is uh, it's it's so hard to describe. I just suggest you sit and you watch it. What's the title again? Dead in a Week or Your Money Back. Dead in a Week and Your Money Back. How many years ago was that? Oh, God, five, six years ago. But I think, it's, yeah, I mean, it's um, it's available on Netflix from time to time and it comes out on Amazon. Um, but it's just a really genuinely good film. Two more. Two more. Whew. 
We're yeah. also not just, uh, I understand, because you... I loved working on Because Do- you're Doctor one of Who. those who loves to, uh, you, you get into script and everything. Because I, if I would say, like, Armor is responsible for getting these kind of guns where they're asking for whatever. But you, you always go through, you read the script, you would understand the storyline, everything. But so, and now when you gave me your first film, it wasn't that much about you uh, having exciting Armor job on it. Oh, there's hardly any guns in it. Exactly. A couple you, of noise. You just gave me oh, no, because of the story. But like uh, you as an Armour armor like someone who represents your trade that's what i'm kind of more trying to squeeze well, out of oh, you. <laughs> oh, okay well the, the one i'm currently on that i can't say because i'm on ndas yeah uh they've given me free reign mm. pretty much um they've given me a lot of guidance we've read the script three or four times um for every episode and what they allowed me to do is come up with something that's different mm. um and you know it's not based now it's based in the near future and then in the distant future and and that gives me a lot more flexibility to be creative so you which know, is I, something what you would prefer instead of someone just tells you here this is what we need and that kind of gun oh i quite like that because that's bloody easy they go oh we need these guns so i turn up with those guns mm. we use those guns i go home but you prefer creativity over just what do what you've been told to it seems pointless to be in an industry that's full of creative people where you're allowed to be creative cool. And not then be creative with it. You, Do you, you think it's difficult to be a creative uh, being an armor? Like in 20 years, how often? It used often to be. Uh, that's why one of the reasons I started mm. on my own is, uh, well, I originally started on my own and now I have a, a business partner. It's having the freedom mm. to pick and choose. I like a script that I'm going to want to watch. Mm. It's a business and I get scripts and some of them, they're not great, but the money's good. <laughs> And so you have to kind of just... But I think like in any industry, it's there's a point uh, where you're just going to do things and you're good enough to kind of say, I want to go to the trailer. You know, I don't care. Oh, I do you know, anyway. Some, someone like, I've done that on everything. Someone like Samuel E. Jackson, who is uh, like, he's one of, like his thing is like, I don't want to do it. I'm not going to do it. Or he, his thing is like, pay me this amount of money and then I will consider if I'm going to do it. Yeah. There Obviously, is- that's where we want to get there, right? We want to get no, to that point. Why would I want to be that much of an arsehole when I'm already this much of an arsehole? Oh, you're already <laughs> enough of an arsehole. <laughs> you know, I don't think the industry could handle me being worse. Um, I, I am. I mean, I, I, do, I do have demands that I put in. Mm. Um, quite often it's just for a laugh because it makes the job fun you know like my Haribo collection I, I, I have it that I want Haribo every week what the hell is Haribo? Haribo it's a, it's a little jelly sweet <laughs> but they're not for me I want a tub of Haribo I mean on um, on knuckle dust yeah they wanted to borrow some equipment off me and Sam uh, who is amazing obviously um, I've been very fortunate we've worked with a lot of amazing people um, Sam, who was working in the art department, and Anna, um, they wanted to borrow some equipment for dressing, so some computers and pelly cases and some military garb and whatnot. And I'm like, yeah, 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 cool. It's going to cost you a kilo of Haribo. <laughs> and they're, what, what do you mean? Well, it's going to cost you a kilo of Haribo. I can't be bothered to put an invoice in. Make sure there's a kilo of Haribo, some custard creams and some coffee pods for my coffee machine. And it's not realistically for me. I know you can tell when members of crew are beginning to flag. Like on um, on The Courier, mm-hmm. when Freddie did the burn. Yeah. Um, Freddie Mason, we love you, buddy. Freddie, Freddie, you're a legend, mate. Yes. I saw him the other week <laughs> on, on a different project. In but the yeah, ages. He's still, he's still absolutely fantastic. I love, a story about Freddie, which I, I would like to tell quickly, is uh, I got him to do skydiving in Madrid. And I remember he did his first jump and he lands it and i remember i landed first and then he lands what's the what's the score just checking now oh it's not the second half's not started yet okay so it's still one it's kicking off in london one oh london goes crazy yeah. football yeah. yeah football 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 um so freddy um landed right after me and that was his first landing and i was like never gonna forget this and he landed and he just stays stands still and then I was like, oh, my God, like something happened. He's in shock, whatever. And then I looked like, Freddie, you're right. And he turns on me and he's like, oh, my God, it was fucking amazing. I love <laughs> and that. I just love that yeah, to see that because um, we were in Maleficent, too. And I was just talking to boys how cool it is to do skydiving. And Freddie was one of the people who was like, oh, yeah, really? And uh, he came over and yeah. He's, it's oh, no, actually, one. it was from Courier. When I did the Courier, that's what I was telling to John Sharp and to Freddie Mason, saying, let's go skydiving. Yeah, I remember that. But it's one of those, you look at the stunt guys and you go, oh, look at him, he's a double-hard bastard. Hmm. 
you know, you get you get a uh, cast as well, actors, really good actors like Gordon Alexander and Lee Charles and those lot. Mm. You know, I went through a difficult time after I'd finished season one of Gangs of London, but they were the first guys on the phone. They're genuinely nice people. Yeah. But you look at them and go, ah, I could rip my neck off. <laughs> I don't want to piss them off. But then you go over and you chat to them for five seconds and they're the nicest people. Well, right? otherwise they wouldn't be in the industry. It's but, um, uh, it's that simple. It, you know, you have to put your ego like somewhere outside. And I mean, it still creeps out once in a while, but, you know, we struggle. <laughs> I think one of the ways to get rid of your ego, start doing Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Well, that's what I'm doing. No ego whatsoever. Um, you weaseled out of my question. So I said three films. First one you mentioned... We there were no guns. Did Second one, we can't projects. talk about. You didn't say three three films. Just okay, three projects. You, you the one I'm currently on. You I've can't say. Said, I can't say. Can you give us at least two examples where they're out to sea and you thought uh, Armory was freaking awesome for you? Oh Jesus! Well, the old guard. What about old guard? Old guard was amazing. And um, Leandro and Greg Rucker wrote and drew an amazing comic, which meant. There was very little work required. As far as an armory perspective goes, we had hundreds of guns out on a regular basis, but we were matching to a comic, and they stayed so faithful to the comic um, that it was not... I didn't have to put much into it. Oh, okay. So, though I loved the job, and I absolutely adored the people, and, and I mean, actresses like uh, Kiki's going to be so big. She's amazing to work with. And, and, and my, basically everybody who was on that, all of the cast, they just gave 110% all day long. Mm. And I remember there was a there was a day we were filming Kentway, I believe it was. And uh, it was like the hottest day of the year. And where we were filming was on a, a, an elevated walkway that was glass inside what is the equivalent of a massive glass... Um, conservatory almost it's not it was it was part of an office building but it mm -hmm. was just all glass and watching um julia shunowitz mm. fight and then charlie's fight on that bridge for the entire day in the sweltering heat being thrown about and then right go again right go again right go again and they just keep doing it i mean it's amazing to watch and it was such a wonderful project to work on but i didn't have to do too much My, um Tim had organised, worked out exactly what we were doing. Mm. I was there to make the guns do the things that they needed to do um, and then just to be there, hand them out and keep everyone safe. So I had a wonderful time, but as far as my input goes, there wasn't as much as there could have been. Okay. Phil, where was a lot of your input? No, oh, the courier, all day long. The courier, okay. Yeah, they just went... Yeah, Man, the Courier a was a lot of guns. And that was really cool because we actually, I played uh, a little part in Courier and I was the uh, one of the, you know, baddies. And each of us, we had on our guns, rifles, we had like uh, like a little... You had a little motif like or a motif. nickname or what something. What was mine? With the business end? Oh, was yeah. The business end I had on mine. Yeah, I think I think we copied that off Deadpool. I can't remember. Yeah. But it was... It was um, everyone had something Everyone different. had something. The costumes... <laughs> The costumes were amazing. The costumes? But, but no, to be fair, the costume department, they are fantastic people. I've worked with them on other projects yeah, since. Yeah. They're really good at their job. They just, they weren't allowed, they were allowed too much freedom in one side and not enough freedom in the other and everything was very constrained. And uh, But the film itself, I mean, I really enjoy the film. Do you remember it's, what happened with my hair? Yeah, your hair was horrendous. Yeah, so I was supposed to be the like the surfer guy and I had quite long hair at the time. And I went to the hairdresser, and they cut my hair like a Peaky Blinder main guy, <laughs> yeah, and it was, uh, it was and they basically look. mixed it up with Neil. Neil Neil already had that haircut, and then they messed it up. And then I a stunt coordinator Peter saw me, and he was like, "What the hell?" And I he, must admit, uh, the show. first time I saw you lot put together, I'm like, "And you're supposed to be mercenaries? You yeah. look like you've just come out of a club in Ibiza." But, I mean, oh, yeah. it was a strong look, and it's what they were going for. And then, you, you know, you've got to bear in mind, there's so many people have input. Mm. And it's always constructive, but there's only one vision that needs to be out there. And, unfortunately, that's what the director wants. And mm. the director wants what he wants. And Zach was so much fun to work with. He knew what he wanted. He had his vision. He had it all sorted. He had everything planned. And then everybody else starts putting their two pen of And you turn up on set, and it's like, that's that's not what I had in my head. Mm. You find it really difficult. But I really enjoyed the career because met a lot of nice people. Still a friend with a lot of them. Um, oh, Alicia from Vikings. 
she was so much fun to work with. I think I've still got a gun around the corner. I, I, I met her also doing uh, makeup, whatever. Yeah. yeah, and so much fun. And obviously, Gary being there. You can't be bad on a film. Ad so this Hull, podcast no. is basically about the career of the film. No, nope, no, nope, we're going to find another one. Um, <laughs> ones that I projects I've really enjoyed. Uh, season ten, Doctor Who. Mm, yes, that was so much fun. Um, I'm not a Doctor Who fan. I'll admit it, hundred percent. Never really been into the Doctor Who thing, but uh, I got Doctor a chance. Who? To, <laughs> <laughs> I got <laughs> getting a chance to work with uh, Peter Capaldi and Paul Mackey and and everyone who's involved uh, and Wayne Yip, Wayne Yip who was directing them. I think it was Wayne. Anyway, doesn't matter. Um, they were all just so much fun. Mm. So we're just on set, and uh, I have to do handling training with various people so i've got to show uh the, the um, i'm trying to remember the, the, the sense police how to use their blank firing guns and then some other people how to use it and then it came to my time to give pearl mackey a pistol hmm. spoiler alert if you've not seen season 10 she shoots the doctor <laughs> but you must have seen it by now if you're a doctor who fan you've already seen it and if you haven't it's not really a spoiler because you everyone knows it so She's never held a gun before. Mm. Oh, that's that's the other thing uh, which I wanted to talk about about ho- handling um, <laughs> firearms yeah. Yeah. and how you struggle to explain to actors, stunt performers, or well, stunt performers they've done it, you know, but like the actors like hold a gun like this and like that. Uh, yeah, in a and way. it's um, it was it, we, we went into another stage uh, to do the practicing because obviously they were filming. A certain bit on that, that stage. So we go, we go into the stage we're going into down in Wales, and uh, I walk in through the curtains, and th- there's the TARDIS in front of me, the interior of the entire TARDIS. <laughs> I'm like, okay, some people are going to go crazy knowing that I'm in here. I, I don't actually care as much, but anyway. And then Pearl comes in, and it's the normal hellos, how are you doing? I'm such and such. Um, and then it's right, this is the pistol you're going to be using. This is a Glock. Um, it's not loaded at the moment. I'll always show you it's safe when I give it to you and all the other bits and pieces. Um, have you used a gun before? No. Nope. Okay, right. So <laughs> this is how you're going to use it. You're going to be semi scared and you're going to be trepidatious about pulling the, 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 the trigger. And, and within about five seconds of having the pistol she's fired two shots and then she's instantly gone to gangster lean shooting <laughs> sideways and since then Pearl Mackey has been my one and only gangster she is the most gangster person so you were happy with her performance oh, is she, that what you're saying when she did it on set I'm on the floor and I, you know it's it's so weird when you work so close to camera yeah when you're watching a scene and, you know, your kids are watching it with you because it's the one film that they can actually watch because everything I do has obviously got lots of death in it because it's guns. Mm. Um, but Doctor Who, yeah, that's okay. And I'm kind of going, yeah, you see that table over there? I'm under the floor there and I'm, I'm behind that and, and, and I'm over there now for this scene. And, and uh, yeah, that's always really weird. But she just did it so perfectly. And, we, I mean, we still stay in contact now, not as much as normal, but um, it, for my son's birthday... He obviously watched Doctor Who because it's the one of Daddy's projects that he mm. can actually watch. So um, it was his, I think it was tenth or eleventh birthday, um, and I'd been away filming, so we hadn't been able to arrange much. So I gave her a quick call and go, "You know how much he loves you and Doctor Who, like, yeah? Um, would you mind? <laughs> I'm going to arrange a lunch." And she was like, "Yeah, that's not God, not a problem. I'll come down." So I take him up to London to go and buy presents or whatever. And uh, we go off to sit down and have a meal because I said, oh, I've booked a table so we can go and have a meal. And we sit down and then two minutes later, Pearl walks in and he just, his jaw just hits the floor. Oh. It's like, oh, my God. And she's like, you're Alfie, aren't you? And she just sat. We had lunch. Nice. And then, um, then there was a Comic-Con that came up and she sent him some tickets so that we could go up there. And it's like, oh, no. you know, he's got the gold pass on. He's like, oh, I'm VIP. I can go anywhere. Nice. And, you know, you bump in. You've got Jason Momoa there and Steven Seagal. And there's so many people. And for them... Uh, for the children, my children, um, it's 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 a big thing, but it really isn't. They don't care about guns. They don't care about swords. They don't care about any of that because that's what just that's what Daddy does. So it's mm. just the equipment. Um, it's being able to go and do the little things. Like um, on Knuckle Dust, he came to my eldest came to set. Yeah, yeah, I remember and, that. And, and uh, yeah, he came and hung out on set. And I, you know, we got there first thing in the morning. He's tired. That's right. First thing you're going to do is you're going to make me a cup of tea and then you're going to go over there. And I went over to see Sam at art department. I'm like, whatever you need doing, give him to do. If yeah. it's carrying, fetching, sweeping, whatever, just give him to do Giving it. the guns out. 
Yeah. Equally given give the guns out, but he really to didn't care. How to use it. Because it's one of those, this is daddy's work. Yeah. And, and everyone kind of, you know, when their friends come over, um, if Alfie's got mates coming over after school, I, I obviously put all the guns away and lock everything up, but it's really difficult. He's got the... Pearl gave him one of the rubber rifles that she was using, and that signed and up on his wall. Um, Were you the one who told me there's another story that uh, one of the actors sent a message? Was it to your mom? Oh my god, Joey! Yes, Joey, tell, tell that one. My god, that <laughs> my mum's a massive fan of the Bourne movies. There you go, the Bourne, yeah. And obviously Joey's in it. Yeah, and I, I work with Joey. What's, on, the, what's the what's his full full name? Joey Answer. Okay. What character I'm was he playing? Sure that's how he's pronounced. What, um, what character was he playing? Was it the first born or second? I think it's the first one. I can't honestly remember off the top of my head. He's like one of the fighting... What did he do? He's one of the baddies. Oh, okay. He gets killed. Yeah, okay. Well, Jason Bourne kills him. Yeah. You know, you know how that movie goes. You're the bad guy, Jason kills you. Um, but my mum watches it and she absolutely adores those movies and she loves Matt Damon and it was her birthday... It was quite a big one. And I'm just like, uh, she lives in South Africa. It's really difficult to kind mm. of send anything. Mm. So I just sent Joey a message. He's like, That's dude, perfect. dude, my mum adores you. Do us a favour. So he just recorded a FaceTime video for her in the middle of lockdown and just sends her over a, over a video. Um, and it's just one of those things. You, you, actors are more approachable than you think they are mm. as long as you're not an arsehole. Yeah, and as long as you treat them just like another other person, you know they are at the end of the day still just people. Mm. They're very well paid people who can act. Yeah, and, and they, they can very make hard us. To be they there. can make us believe that they're not that one person that they normally are. You know, you see Tom Cruise, and you go, "It's a Tom Cruise movie." I pretty much know what I'm going to get, and then he comes at you from a different angle, mm. and like the Jack Reacher stuff. I think he he's really good in those. I really enjoy those movies, mm. and he he he's a talented actor. They're all talented. They work at their craft, and the other thing is that there's a level they get to, uh, as I think, as far as actors go, where they suddenly realise, do you know what? This industry may seem like it's big, but it's actually really really small. Yeah, it is. Very and small. I guarantee you that any actor or actress whether they're at the top of their game or the bottom of their game if they're an arsehole to someone on set mm. that grip that spark will tell their mate mm. he'll tell their mate and before you know it mm. every single studio in the UK will know that story before they've even got in their car and gone home yeah okay on this one let's finish the second segment and then we're going to have one more more? Yeah, we're going to have one more you're trying to get it all at me Bullshit. <laughs> what do you what do you have any any big projects uh, on uh, on the plan to be part of yes. lined up which you not, can't talk about <laughs> because you know the industry yeah. we can't talk, we can't about, talk it. about it. Yes there are. Um uh we got uh my headphones on the wrong way around. Yeah, they are. Um we have <laughs> Does it make any that. difference? Yeah. How does it make difference? Oh yeah, yeah, it's not comfy. Because the fucking cable you Yeah, yeah, you said um, you're not you're not allowed to swear. <laughs> beep, fuck, beep, sorry. Beep. Um, no, uh, we're doing we've got a project with Amazon at the minute. I'm doing one for HBO. Or I'm starting one for HBO shortly. Uh, we've got a couple of Netflix ones underway. But you know what it's like, right? We but have right now your so career, many. your career is kind of a peak, peak as like. Oh, you're saying it's all downhill from here? No, no, no. In 20 years, like this is your like the the busiest you've been ever. I've got five years left to, before I retire. Mm. Okay, I, ha I have a plan. Good. The yeah. plan is going well at the moment, and if it continues to go like this, five years, yeah, moving to Wales, done. Nice. You're just gonna live in your 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 house near Lake. Yeah, my business partner is uh, gonna go we've, fishing. We've, we've already got an arrangement of exactly how much it's gonna be. As long as we're at that position. I will retire. Nice. Uh, what would you suggest to people who would like to be an armor? Who w would like to get into this? <laughs> Obviously, we mentioned the film industry is the worst. You don't, don't want to get in there. Don't do it. The family life is going to be tough, but... For two reasons. A, it will screw your life up unless you're single and you really don't care about people. <laughs> and B, you then become competition to me. <laughs> so these are two reasons yeah, why not to do it. Don't get into it. Um, <sighs> They could get into it five years later from now. 
You could just send me a CV. <laughs> send me a CV. There you go. Jesus, at the minute, we're running out of staff. I'm yeah, hurry, you can I'm, find Stephen Leak on IMDb. He always says, like, oh, check my IMDb. I'm so, like, I'm the uh, highest rate. never say that. <laughs> go screw yourself. I don't think I'll ever say that. It's not even... It's not even on the web page. Is it not? No, my IMDb is not on the web page. Oh. I don't care about that crap. Unless it's really, really high. And then, <laughs> like everybody, you go, oh, look, I'm at 23,000. Oh, I'm, I'm 23,000 most influential person currently today at this point in time in the film industry because six people looked at my web page. No, it's, IMDb is great. I have to say that because I pay the money every month to make sure my page is up to date. Um, mm. But it's a really useful tool yeah. for me for finding out <laughs> When I get the new unit list through, which is the bit of paper they always send us, well, the email that we get through that tells us everybody who's working on the project, so I can click on it and go, how many of these have I worked with before? Mm. And then it brings up, and you kind of go, oh, good, it's such and such. Oh, yeah, no, that's good. It'll be an all right job. Uh, if, if it comes up and I don't know a single person, eh, then it's it may be harder. But for you, it's like, it's not just an armory and understanding about the guns and all that. You are do, you're so... Still 1-0, by the way. So knowledgeable. Yes, we're watching football at the same time <laughs> as well. Um, you're so knowledgeable, like an uh, el electricianist. Ele I am an electrician. Yeah, and then uh, you were building some stages and building some moving doors and all the electrical I stuff. I work that, with some special effects teams. That really comes handy as I've well. I've been very fortunate. I've, I've, I've been able to work with people like uh, Mike Dawson and... Um, uh, Fizzbang Wallop and Alex Gunn, mm. Arcadia FX. Um, these people are legends. And there's a, there's a guy, his name's Harry Bryce. His father pretty much built Hoth, I, I believe, I seem to remember. Um, he's worked on all sorts. His first job was on Alien mm. when he was 13. Everyone knows working, Alien. Working with go. his dad. Um, what was Hoth? Star Wars, Star Empire Wars. Strikes Back. All oh, right, yeah, um, and his his entire family was pretty much in the film industry. Um, and then one day, he did a film. Uh, he worked on Hot Fuzz. He was part of Artem with mm. Hot Fuzz, um, and he just went, "I don't like this industry." And he just got out. The reason we were just talking about Hot, hot Fuzz uh, was because <laughs> Stephen said this thing. He said, nobody says me nothing. Nobody tells me nobody nothing. Nobody tells me nothing. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone has seen Hot Fuzz, there's this one police officer who says that all the time. Nobody tells me it's, nothing. Uh, Bill Bailey does that. Bill Bailey, he's but, awesome. Um, yeah, and, and he just got out. And he looks after his kids. He was there for his kids to go to school. Uh, and, and he made a, a really good career for himself. And then he just said, no, nope, enough's enough. I want to put time over my family. And he's always been my go-to. If I'm working for a special effects team, because uh, having your own company, uh, my own, uh, the, the armory firm, uh, it affords me the ability to go, right, there's my crew. You're taking care of that. And my business partner, he... He still loves the industry. He's not bitter like me. So he loves being there and being mm. on set and doing the meetings. So I can then take a step back and go and do things that I want to do. So I had the opportunity to go and work on um, a TV series for a, a, a very big TV series and um, working in the special effects team. I was like, okay, I'll go do it. Mm. I, got, I got asked to go down, as with most of this, I started out as an electrician. I went down to go and help them do some wiring. Um, I knew some of the crew, I knew the supervisor, and he was like, do you want to just stay for a couple of weeks? Originally, I went in for two days. Uh, he asked me to stay for three weeks. I was there for seven and a half months. And it's really useful. They go, they kind of go, I need, I need this to do a thing. Yeah. So they'll put it on my desk at the workshop, and I'll be like, I need this to shoot water out the front and make steam, and I need it to do it on command, and I need to do it repeatedly. Okay. Now I get two days, I'm paid to invent something, come up with some way of making that happen. And the special effects teams have to be so creative. I mean, Haley and, and all, all of the special effects companies out there, that they really work hard to make the most mundane thing happen. Hmm. And but most these things you can do because you're so well rounded. I mean, you well, are. Thank you very much. Well, yeah, you're calling me fat again, aren't you? No, I'm. I put on some weight. It's, it's <laughs> lockdown weight. Shut up. I didn't say rounded. I say well rounded. <laughs> it's one all, people. It's gone to one all. You're like, what is it? One all. Italy must have scored. Oh wow. One. Yeah, I know. Not that. 
It's football. Yeah, but looks um, like London is going to go down tonight. I have the ability to do a lot of things. You've done cars. You've been like crazy about cars for a long time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah you used just to race. Take, yeah, you used to uh, mention me like a couple of the biggest things what you've done in the past before you became an armor and so elect ele electric. The electrician thing has yeah. afforded me the ability to do a lot of things because I was lucky enough um, to do a favor for one client very early on when I started my electrician's firm up and he just happened to be incredibly wealthy mm. and incredibly untrusting of people. So when it got out that I was a trustworthy person, all of his friends would start employing me to do stuff for them and then mm. it just snowballed from there to the point in time where I'm hanging, you know, million pound chandeliers or having to come up with interesting concepts again for various people's properties where they go oh, i want this lighting but i don't know what i want and then i've got free reign and whatever budget i really require to make the thing happen you know i've had a had a client turn around and go he wanted a uh, what was it 150 inch tv because he had a hole that was 150 inches i think i remember the story i think yeah you told me and it's story. like okay so how do i do this well i get in touch with lg they make me the tv i have it delivered it doesn't fit up the staircase so we have to get it craned onto the roof the penthouse of this building so that we can get it in um but yeah i mean i've been ridiculously fortunate mm. i mean i've never won the lottery but mm. i have won so many other things i don't think the lottery is a very good fortune i think that that i think that would be a bad idea I yeah, don't, that's why i don't play someone it, just so sends you money that's no yeah, still won't. um so steven was also he helped me uh with my van that's a, <laughs> that was a big project la yeah. last year you keep putting your hand in front of the camera because look that's just amazing look at that that's, yeah. uh, that's like <laughs> that, that actually looks really weird it looks so it. much better wait yeah. if, if you can make it come out of my shoulder then <laughs> Um, I brought my I it's bought this van for my um, for it to transport my bikes around and then uh, Stephen helped me out and uh, the best story goes how he uh, got the cup holder. In oh, you can screw <laughs> off! Right. Yeah, who want a cup holder in a van that's not designed to have a cup holder? He basically shape. almost cut the the van in half, burned his face off to to get the cup holder, and then when he put it in, as you take it out, you can't use it because of the gear. Yeah, but you shouldn't be you shouldn't be having a drink in your car if you're going to use the gear stick. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, yeah. Look, I reversing camera, subwoofer, a carpet at the back. You've got multiple changing camera is not working. Lights in the back. <laughs> yeah, it was working when you had it. Uh, you got you got TV, stereo. You got fucking everything. I even put the blooming chip on the engine for you. The thing worked. I can't help it if you can't drive. There you go. It's all my fault. It goes down to my fault. Uh, excuse me. And the bike ramp in the back. Yay. Is bike it not ramp. the coolest bike that ramp is, in the world? That is the coolest one, yeah. Yeah. So it's like hit or and miss with you. Did I make you. that it's out? Like of hit shit. or miss with you. <laughs> <laughs> did I was hit or miss. <laughs> yeah. No, it's actually some of the bike guys, bike enthusiasts, when they saw it, basically what he, what Stephen did, he put a um, door locker the door, on the, door on the ramp, so I can, when I open the door in a van, I can just like latch it to the uh, to the end of the van, and it, it just means it will never there. fall off. Yeah. So that you can well get done. your bike in it. Well done. Out of 100, Stephen gets it. <laughs> not true, not true. Yeah, yeah uh, 90, you, 95. you still want that camera fixed, right? <laughs> I know where the cable is. Okay, so the title of this podcast is A Collection of Blueprints, right? Uh, if I would ask you, what is your blue blueprint? Do you have an answer for it? My blueprint? Yeah. For what? So the blueprint for your life. I don't think that's probably a very good idea. I think having a blueprint is mm. a very bad idea because if I'd have had one of those, I wouldn't have had 90% of the original experiences that I have had. Mm. I wouldn't have ended up in Hong Kong. I wouldn't have ended up in Australia. I wouldn't have ended up in South Africa. I just wouldn't have ended up mm. where I am now. And there have been proper lows, you know, zero money, pretty much living on the street kind of lows. And now I'm here. We're in this massive garage. There's, house kids you know i wouldn't have done that if mm. i'd have followed a blueprint and i'd have had a plan and gone this is what i'm going to do you know i, I always wanted to be a, an armorer the mm. second i saw aliens and i'm like really that That's is when you bloody did. cool oh, wow. uh, you know, the second i saw the pulse rifles uh, and everything else and i've been really fortunate in i call it let's call him a friend um the the, the guy who actually designed it the armorer who did that i I see him on a fairly regular basis. He's a legend. He's mm. uh, He doesn't get it. He doesn't get that he's a legend. He doesn't get that there's a billion people out there that know his work and, you know, uh, it's very difficult to explain. 
But if I'd have had a blueprint and I'd have followed it, I'd have gone, I'd have stayed in college, I'd have finished my engineering course, I'd have mm. gone on to be like my dad, and that's what I was going to do because that's the way life works. And, and having a fixed path would completely negate any deviation from it. Yeah. And but those I think- deviations have got me to this point in time where I'm sat in my garage by my son's train set with a random Lithuanian who's just turned up with shit and then complained that my garage is a mess because he can't film in it. I'm not sure how that's my fucking problem. <laughs> I'll show the video of what is going on here just a little later. Um, <laughs> no, you won't. But no, actually, this is the thing. That is your blueprint. So when I when I, it's it's quite difficult to um, to. Explain. I almost feel like taking my glasses off and looking at you, it's so like, you can see the look on like, my face. If that's your blue, the no blueprint is your blueprint. That's not a fucking blueprint. <laughs> well, no plan is your plan. It's no, like, no, there's still a plan. Yeah, there is a plan, but it's but not. The plan is for the next ten to fifteen minutes. <laughs> to stop this conversation no the plan is the next 10 to 15 minutes what yeah. i'm going to do and if i'm there was a whole period you know there's been loss in my life there's been various issues there's been all sorts of odds and sods i don't drink anymore thank mm. god if i'd have carried on doing that i probably wouldn't have woken up one day waking up in the morning is a blessing i go to bed really late i don't like sleep i'll go to bed at 2 a.m i'll wake up at 5 a.m i'll go to work and i'm not tired yeah these days, I'm a bit older, I'm a little bit tired. Mm. But I don't want to waste 24 hours of my life sleeping or six hours of my life sleeping or four hours of my life sleeping when I don't have to because there's so much living to do on the in-between period. Mm. And anything that comes along, I pretty much say yes to. I think it was a film <laughs> yesterday or something. But it's not that bad. Yes, it's, man. Yeah, yes, that, man. Yes, man. That was it. That's Jim Carrey, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I need, I need to de- uh, kind of walk away from the blueprint thing. Yeah, because it doesn't gonna, fucking work. I think you change the name of the podcast. You're going to start throwing <sighs> things at me. Well, that's the only uh, name was available, so I kind of stuck with it. <laughs> um, so what, are, what would be the tips for uh, people, um, what you could suggest to anyone? Just like, let's focus on our industry. So not just armor, like film industry. What about it? What kind of tips you can give to people who want to get in this industry? Get your head checked. <laughs> go and see a psychologist and just make sure that you're 100% prepared and then go and spend a bit of time. Because mm. the, the problem is, is that there are so many, there used to be so many easier ways into this industry and now there isn't. Mm. The doors have been closed. It's a lot of, I'm a friend of such and such or I'm the son of such and such to get you into the industry. Mm. Um, walking straight in with nothing isn't necessarily going to help. Um, there's a brilliant director, Kevin Smith. Bloody love that guy. I've always loved his movies. Dogma just changed my life because it's Dogma is amazing. Yeah, it's just an amazing. It's Janine Garofalo. I mean, it's an amazing film. Um, he started going to college or university and learning how to make films, and then he just got two credit cards, maxed them out, and made his own film. Mm-hmm. That we, you've got so much technology. Let's see what the score is. One, one all still. Um, the iPhone 12, the, the new Pro, the camera on that, it's amazing. Mm. It's not going to set the world alight, but if you're going to want to make a movie and you want to direct a movie or film a movie, you have everything you need pretty much in your hand. In the tip of your fingers, yeah. To make your story. Mm. What's more important is the story. Yeah. If yeah, you're yeah. going to go down that route. If you just want to get in the film industry, be a runner. PA, what are they called now? I can't remember what the. Well, just be group. passionate about anything you want to do. It's just and, and go extra mile and do you know be honest with you as well. With but the, 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 there's another problem with that. There's a problem with being a hundred percent good. I know a great PA. Let's call him a PA because I think that's what we're, like, we're supposed to call him now. He's brilliant, hundred percent brilliant. Mm. And the problem is he is so good that any production would find it really difficult to replace him with somebody Mm. who's as good. So he can't get past that. He can't get to the third AD step. He can't get to the, you know, he can be a head PA or, you know, whatever. But trying to make it to the the, the next step for him is becoming more and more impossible as the years go by because he's so well known at doing the one thing that he does really well, really well. Mm. And much as he wants to go that next step, he doesn't make it there. Because why? Why would a producer give you that chance knowing that everything below there that you're already he's already in control of would then potentially fall to shit Mm. and that's going to cause him delays 
So you kind of need to be good enough to then fail a bit so that you just generally get bumped up the list. It's like being a Tory. <laughs> it's like being a Tory politician. They fail upwards. Um, you, you can almost fail upwards in this. There's a lot of people in a lot of positions where you go, dude, really? <laughs> you, you, no. But they're there, and they, get, they don't go backwards from there. You, they stay at that level. And it's kind of like the progression thing. Yeah. The progression within the industry. I suppose for a stunt performer, it might not be the same. But at quite a lot of departments, you'll start off as a trainee or an assistant camera or something, and then you'll move your way up. And the films and projects you're working on become bigger and bigger until you're like almost on a Ridley Scott kind of thing. Mm. Then to go from that position of being an assistant camera operator to a camera operator, you've got to go all the way back to the bottom mm. because you're now going to be able to be a camera operator on a low-budget film because you're now at that position. Yeah, but yeah, there's no there's yeah. no room for you yeah. in the price bracket of film unless you're really lucky, and it is 99% luck, this industry. So you have to go back down again and start again. You know, There's a lot of people who want to be directors. I don't know why they would want that pressure. It's a horrendous amount of pressure. But you'll work your way through until you're almost at the point where you want to be a director. And then you have to go back to the bottom and start again. Because the only job you're going to be offered as a director with your CV is yeah. you've not been a director yet. We're not going to give you a £20 million job. We're going to give you a £500,000 job if you're lucky. If not, it'll be a fifty grand short or something. And you'll start back at the bottom again. But that's all about how much you want it, and are you willing to take that risk? Um, talking about risk, how often do you think you've taken big risks in your life? All the time. All the time. All the time. I, and then I, you, do you follow like your gut feeling? Yeah. In a much. sense of like, I I just know that I want to do this. You ever see Batman? Of course, I've seen a Batman. Which one, Batman? You know, so you know Two Face, Tommy Lee Jones. Yeah. You know the coin. Hmm. Or even we go the Harvey, Harvey Dent. We go the whole route. Right. I pretty much have a coin. If I'm really undecided about a decision, I flip, flip a coin. Yeah. And where it lands will make me decide what it is. Because if it lands and I'm upset about the way it's landed, I think they did a thing like this in, I mean, I've always been like that. I think they did a thing like that in uh, the Big Bang Theory. Mm. You know, you toss a coin, you say heads, it lands on tails. <laughs> I really wanted it to be heads. Then you know heads was the right choice. That was the one you should be doing. Right. So your gut kind of rules, but chance also rules. Um, and just making sure you're in the right place at the right time. And you never know where that time's going to be. And you never know where that place is going to be. But you just have to go, ah, screw it. I mean, yeah. the risks I've taken are ridiculous. I had a perfect job or a very good job. Um, I was working with my dad, actually. Uh, this was while I was outside the film industry. And my first son was born. Mm. And I just had an operation on my wrist, so I couldn't even use my hand. And that was the exact day I decided to quit my job and start up my electrician's firm. Literally. And I had no work. No work for three, four weeks. And, and the I, reason for that was because you were really knew that that's I just what you knew I needed a change. Change, yeah. I stagnate in a job. Um, mm. I need to be doing something. And building houses with uh, with my dad and uh, his firm was, was lovely. It was great, but... I was always going to be, no matter how good I was at my job, I had to be a hundred times better than anyone else because I wasn't just there, I was also his son. Mm. Uh, and I love my dad to bits, he's awesome. But it's one of those, I just didn't want to be there just because of the fact that I was his son. Mm. So I just thought, you know what, I've got, I've, my son's here, um, I need to make a change, I'm just going to do it. We'd bought the house, we were, we'd moved in, didn't know how I was going to pay the mortgage or anything. Just, I know that I'm a qualified electrician, it's time to go and do something. Let's go do it. Let's go get out and do it. Mm. So I did. Just quit it. And then my literature firm was doing massively well. Really, really well. And I got the opportunity to come back into the film industry. And I'm just like, yeah. Do you know what? Screw this. I'm done. Mm. I'm doing massive jobs. Um, but I'm going to give it all up and start from the bottom again. And I jumped back into the armory industry and the film industry. And yeah, now I'm here. And give it five more years. And I will think of something else. I've been offered the opportunity to direct, which I think is laughable. Um, but, yeah, I might do that. Um, I've worked in most departments. Just uh, on smaller films, sometimes the boom op's not there. And the sound mixer's like, you wouldn't mind holding the boom for a bit. Yeah. And then you realise how difficult it is. And you go, I'm not doing that again. Mm. <laughs> you know. Um, 
But it's all about giving that try, giving that first move and just not being afraid of like, worst case scenario, yes, you're going to fail or go back to. I think that's what people struggle. A lot of people struggle with that and they sit in that rat race and they work for their daddies and whatever till till they drop and then they see that they hate hate themselves. But I think it's just to make that move. The same thing how I moved away from Lithuania. <laughs> yes, because you are the little Lithuanian, which I should be. I think that's what the podcast should be called. Learn a little Lithuanian. But I'm Latvian. Exactly. <laughs> well, learn a little Latvian then. <laughs> Call it what you like. I don't care. Blueprint. There is no blueprint. There you go. That's that's Steven right no, there. Listen. Uh, see, the, back to what you were just saying. Right? Yeah. I think what it is, is I'm missing some gene. There's some part of my brain that doesn't function. I don't have a fear of failure. Hmm. I don't care if I fail. Every single film, no matter how big it's been, I always think to myself, ah, this is my last job. I may as well enjoy it. And I just end up enjoying it. Every good job I've had, I've been like, ah, they're going to find out. You know, it's, like, it's the imposter syndrome kind of thing. It's like, yeah, they'll find out that I'm not actually as good as I think I am. <laughs> and then I'll be gone. So I may as well just enjoy it and drink all the coffee from the machine and see what happens. I'm going to photocopy my ass and mail it to the boss. And then he finds it funny. And the next thing you know, you're promoted. You know, there's, some, there's, there's so many stupid things. But having a fear of failure holds so many people back. Yeah. So many people back from achieving 100%. so much more. There's in, there's so many creative people out there and intelligent and smart people that are scared that, you know, the, the kids that don't put their hand up in class when they know they know the answer or they know they've got a solution or they know they've worked something out. There is, there is just so much um, that people could do with their time if they didn't give up on the fact that failure is going to be a bad thing. You... As a stunt person, when you throw yourself off the top of that high dive board, you've committed. You don't fear failure. You're concerned about hitting the water, right? There's no fear of failure. There's, I need to do it right, because if mm. I fail, I'm dead. Mm. <laughs> and if you don't, you, you lot miss that gene as well. You yeah, must do, yeah, because, you, you know, you'll throw yourself at a moving I vehicle. Have, I have exactly the perfect example. When I was doing high diving, there was this one move which I really wasn't sure about. And there was sometimes I would go uh, climbing up on the uh, 10 meters board and I was just like, okay, I'm probably going to die this time, but fuck it. I was just going to give my best. Yeah. And, you know, maybe, and then you go and you actually smash it and you execute it well and you, when you're done. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm trying to think that I think there's one point in my life where I have let the fear of failure actually into my day. And it was at the Reading Festival. It would have been early 90s. Uh, remember, because I... I think it was either Nirvana who was on stage or it might have been the year after. Um, and I was on top of the bungee jumping. Mm. The crane went up and I'd had a few drinks and I'd smoked a bit of weed because back then I did do those kind of things. And, you know, teenager in you. And we get to the top and you're all tied on. Everything's ready to go. They open the door and he goes, right, I want you to step forward to the edge and it's going to be one, two, three, bungee. And then you just lean forward and it's it's fine. I was like, oh, okay, cool. And I got to the edge of that and I looked down and he's like, right, one, two, three, bungee. And I leant forward. And as I leant forward, my arms went windmilled over and I grabbed the sides of the cage and I pulled myself back in. No. And he goes, what are you doing? I went, well, I don't think I was ready. Oh, no. And you know at that point, when you've pulled yourself back in, you're not going. You're not going. You're not going. No. So he was like, yeah, no, no, look, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Just, just if you look over there and I looked over and as I looked over, he pushed me, he pushed me out of the cage <laughs> and I went straight down and all of the alcohol I'd had all day long <laughs> when I hit the bottom turned into a hangover and I came straight back up with a hangover <laughs> and I just remember swinging thinking, this is a terrible hangover. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not a fan of this, um, but I was kind of enjoying it. And then I got off it and I just went, I'm never doing that again. <laughs> and then the following day, sober, I went back and I went, ah, it can't have been that bad because now I'm sober. I kind of remember it being fun. So I paid the 35 quid or whatever it was. It was blooming expensive for the time. Yeah. Went back up, got to the edge of the thing, jumped. Yeah, no problem. It was fine. And I think that was, I think that was probably the last time where I let the fear of failure hmm. overtake me. But since then, I just, fuck it, what's the worst that can happen? Exactly. I'm not a religious person. When I'm dead, I'm dead, that's it. 
Yeah, you look I'm, like I'm, you look like Jesus though, just stepping out. Yeah, because Jesus was well known for his red hair and his sunglasses. Because <laughs> he was he was a dude. Oh, listen, Stephen, this was freaking awesome. Uh, we had done one of the cameras just died. We still have that camera. So listen, thank you so much for uh, having this time with me. And he's, I'm he's, just completely he's ignoring you now, just to make sure <laughs> the football's going. And it's still one all at ninety four minutes, two minutes left. It's going to go to extra time. There and then go. it's going to go to penalties, and then the chances are we're going to lose, and then England's going to erupt. And, and then the riot's going to break yay through. Yay, football. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> after we won the last one, I literally sent a message to my friend, and he was like, did you watch the football? I'm like, yeah, go sports. <laughs> I don't care. I don't um, care. Hopefully the uh, football fan's not watching this one. Um, and if they are, um, my name is... Uh, <laughs> Joseph. <laughs> I'll go with Joseph. Joseph, here you go. From Lithuania. Awesome, buddy. Thank you so much. Listen, no this problem. was sick. I'm just um, glad we both had our COVID tests. Yeah, we did. <laughs> Double jabs. <laughs> yeah, so this was uh, <laughs> a collection of little friends with Steven. Come on, give it a dance. Come on, little dance. Come on. I can do one. <laughs>